Explore FDA-approved Vivgot, Fgot Tigamod Alpha FCAB, see the data, and learn how it may help your adult patients at vivgothcp.com. Vivgot is a registered trademark of Argenix. This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hi, this is Greg Day from Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Ron Postuma from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Dr. Postuma is a movement disorder specialist who is part of the original team credited with establishing the connection between dream enactment behaviors and neurodegenerative diseases associated with alpha-synuclein, including Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies. But on this edition of the podcast, we're going to lean away from his expertise in movement disorders and lean into a discussion on sleep. More specifically, the effects of shifts in daylight caused by season and our government and international policies that move time by an hour for us twice a year to discuss everyone's favorite topic, daylight savings time. As part of this discussion, we'll be chatting about a new publication from Ron and his team published in Neurology titled Effects of Season and Daylight Savings Time Shifts on Sleep Symptoms, Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Ron, thanks for joining me today and welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure. As I said in the introduction, we're going to talk about a topic that's of great interest to neurology trainees, faculty, and patients. It's also a topic that all of us need, few of us get enough of, and that topic is sleep and the international conventions that shift us forward or backwards depending on the time of year. It's a safe bet that most of our listeners have an opinion on daylight savings time that's fueled by personal experience, maybe medical knowledge, and probably a combination of these things. But most likely don't know the history of daylight savings time. Ron, can you talk us through how daylight savings time came to be? So daylight savings has been debated back and forth. Even Benjamin Franklin initially suggested that this might be a good idea. It's often thought of as a way of saving energy, and it's essentially saving daylight for when people are generally awake. That's the idea. As a formal policy in North America, it is actually Canada that did it first. A city called Port Arthur, which is now Thunder Bay, in 1900, started the daylight savings. That eventually disappeared. Then just after World War I in the U.S., it became a large larger scale thing. And the main idea was energy savings plus or minus enjoyment. And those are the main rationale. And it's been going back and forth over the decades between states, between provinces. Sometimes we have it and sometimes we don't. And just was changed most recently by the George Bush administration, making it a little bit longer. And I think if my slight research on the topic is correct, pretty much all but four states and provinces in one territory in Canada and the United States acknowledge or follow daylight savings time. Is that your take on it as well? Yes, there's a few that hold on to standard, but it must be said that many of those that hold on to standard actually are on ends of the time zone that correspond to what would be considered daylight savings for most of the rest of us. So it was created with some good intent, saving energy, maybe maximizing enjoyment, What's the evidence? Does it work? And do we see benefits in those departments? Well, I will say that the main rationalization energy utilization has been somewhat disappointing and somewhat equivocal. Uh, the best statistic I saw was maybe a 0.3% overall savings in electricity use by the use of daylight savings, which is not nothing. 0.3% of the entire country's electricity is something. But it's not as much as perhaps would have been anticipated. There is some economic benefit as well. Uh, so the longer evenings tend to increase shopping and leisure activities. On the other hand, Netflix and Disney and uh, Amazon might like it less because there's less TV watching because simply the night comes later. In actual overall terms, the benefit, however, appears to be small in the terms of the sort of finance accountancy sort of stuff. I was wondering if, if streaming services were going to come into play on that topic and maybe expanding a bit past the television. Are there other potential detriments or harms associated with this shift in sleep cycles to match the shifting in daylight? 
So there has been a fair amount of study on this and the main detriments, we're, t- we're doctors here, so let's talk about sort of health outcomes. And the, the two main studies that are talked about the most in terms of decremental health outcomes relate to accidents and to cardiovascular disease. So it's been demonstrated, at least in North America, that there is a 6% increase in fatal accidents on the day or week after daylight savings time and a smaller increase after the change towards standard time. First of all, let me explain to everybody, daylight savings is what we're getting in the summer. Standard timing is what we're getting in the winter. Okay, so daylight savings means the sun goes to bed. I always get this little uh, difficult. Uh, it goes to bed a little bit later. So, okay, 6% of fatal accidents sounds terrible. It must be said that most of this is on the Sunday of the daylight savings itself and is actually even lower the next day. And it's been suggested that is it really an increase in fatal accidents per mile or is it just that the night is longer and so people go out and drive more? And so the effect is much less clear than the statistics that are quoted. And there may be some evidence over the long term of a decrease because simply people are driving less during the night hours in the summer. So that's a pretty equivocal harm. There's a similar story with workplace accidents may go up by about 5% or so. These are relatively modest harms, and I think a little less than what people tend to claim. The cardiovascular one is really quite clear. There was a a relatively large study, a well-performed study, which uh, showed a 24% increase in myocardial infarctions in the week following daylight savings time changes. Now, that obviously sounds very, very concerning. What is almost never mentioned is that there is a 21% decrease a corresponding decrease in the change towards standard time. So it's the transition to daylight savings increases the risk, but the transition towards standard time when you get an extra hour of sleep actually decreases the risk. Net effect is essentially zero. So the health effects, I would say, are perhaps not as bad as is initially sold in terms at least of these main uh, events. Well, thank you for that expert summary of the potential benefits and also the potential risks, recognizing that these may be more moderate than first build. But we still see daylight savings time persisting. And so surely that must be either because people love it or maybe there's some other health benefits that need to be considered when we're making these decisions. What's your thought on that? When people say, I hate daylight savings, I think what they're almost referring to universally is the transition itself and not to daylight savings time itself. When you do surveys of daylight savings, it has incredibly strong support. And the reason is very obvious. I woke up at 5.30 this morning because the sun was streaming into my room and that's on daylight savings. 4.30 in the morning feels to everyone like a complete waste. And so people really enjoy that extra hour of evening activities. Everyone loves the bonus time with their friends and family. And so this has led to people thinking, well, let's just fix daylight savings time permanently. And in fact, that was done once in 1974. And people were concerned on the other end is I'm walking my kids to school and it's pitch dark and they never get any sun because they're never outside. And so within a year, this changed back. So there's a lot of back and forth on this. And the right answer is not very clear of what to do. So you're saying that people want to have it all. We want to be awake when the sun comes up. We want everyone else to be awake when the sun comes up. We just don't want to bother with any of these nasty transitions that can upset our sleep cycles and cost us an hour in the spring. Is that correct? That's a perfect summary. How does your recent publication really add to this discussion? What what have we learned from the work you've been engaged in? This is the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging. So it's a group of 50,000 people of whom 30,000 have a very thorough interview that occurs throughout the year. And these are people across Canada who are aged 45 to 85. And as part of this, there was a brief questionnaire just to assess how you feel about sleep. And so we decided that this is an amazing opportunity. It's essentially one of those economic experiments. Economists do this all the time where there's an artificial change. And so you can look at the overall change in sleep over time. And then you can look at people's reporting of sleep right at the time of the transition, the week before and the week after. And that's sort of an experiment of nature, if you will. And so the first thing you have to do when you're doing this is you look at the changes in the season, right? Is summer different than winter? And in fact, we did not find many changes at all. People reported a similar satisfaction with sleep, similar prevalence of insomnia, whether that be falling asleep or staying asleep, similar sleepiness during the day, really no difference according to symptoms. But there was a slight difference in the sleep duration, about only five minutes. So people sleep five minutes less in the summer. So anything we're going to see that changes abruptly is not a seasonal transition. 
So now we have two times that we can assess. We can assess the change to daylight savings and we can assess the change to standard time. And we don't have the same people asking the same question twice, but we have large numbers of people answering the question before the change and the week after. And so what do we see? The transition to daylight savings has essentially no effect on self-reported sleep. People are sleeping just as well, same amount of satisfaction, insomnia, somnolence. There is a bit of a shorter sleep duration in daylight savings in that one week. It's about nine minutes long, pretty modest overall. However, when we go to the standard time, so remember this is November, okay? Things are getting dark, things are getting cold. At around that transition, there is a relatively clear effect. And so we see about a 50% to a doubling in the increased risk of difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, sleeping too much during the day, and an overall decrease in sleep satisfaction. So some pretty clear effects. I will say that those effects were essentially gone one week later. So we see it in the transition, but if we ask people two weeks after the transition, it's just back to the way it was before. Well, thank you for that synopsis on the study. And I think what you're showing are we can measure self-reported sleep effects. We also get perspectives on how people feel about each of these transitions. What new understanding do we gain from this population level data? And how can we use that to inform our policies as we move forward? I guess it's important also to clarify that this is not the only study that's done this. And so the literature on this has generally found a little bit of a difference in that many studies have been done in adolescence, for example, finding that the daylight savings was the trouble. So the transition to summer was trouble. And so we wondered a little bit about why that might be the case. And then we realized, well, there's two things. First of all, there's a general halo effect. I think a lot of this Sleep dissatisfaction is how crummy November is in Canada, and people are just more sensitive to any change in their schedule. I don't think we should underscore how important that can be. But I think probably the big reason that adolescents get worse in, in Germany, at least in this one study, during daylight savings, but we got worse in November, is the biological clocks. And so re remember, we're dealing with old people, or relatively old people, I'm in that age group myself, and our biological clocks get shorter with age. So what we're asking people to do in November is we're asking them to sleep in. And that's really difficult for old people. They have a hard time sleeping in. Adolescents in the November, sorry, no problem sleeping in, but in the spring, asking them to wake up an hour early is a big problem. So we don't get the same effect. And I think it might vary a little bit with age. I appreciate you clarifying that and particularly addressing you know, this unique paradox. I think for most of us, certainly anyone in residency and training, it seems that as long as you're not on call, gaining an hour would be the beneficial time of year. Losing it would be the one that we all loathe. But I think this, this sleep conservation and the ability to sleep in and change your cycle as needed you know, may underpin some of that paradox. So I guess the second part of your question is now what? Okay. It's important to recognize there's a lot of context going on right now. There's an incredible amount of discussion about what to do. So there's a bill uh, in front of, I believe it's the U.S. Senate now, to abolish the change. And a similar bills appear periodically in the individual Canadian provinces. And so there's a very strong move afoot to stop the seasonal changes. The hard question that comes up is what direction? So if you're a sleep researcher, and I'm supposed to say this, okay, we should be pushing for permanent standard time. And the reason for that is relatively clear. It is quite abundant that morning light is very important in general, particularly with adolescents and kids in school who really need that morning light to get their day started. So if the kids are walking to school and it's the middle of night, they're going to have a tough day in school. So this probably aligns better with the optimal circadian rhythms, particularly in younger people. And there's some fascinating studies, which I think we have to be very careful in interpreting, suggesting that studies on eastern end of time zones have higher socioeconomic status than those on western end of time zones. So people who get an earlier morning daylight may do socioeconomically better, but I think we have to think very carefully about the number of confounds. For example, the very large east coast and coastal effects and latitude effects and all that sort of stuff. So that's the reason why we're supposed to go to permanent standard time, but a strong majority of people in their daily lives, and me too, I must say, would strongly prefer a permanent daylight savings time just in terms of your life and just the happiness of the evening summer. And so it goes back and forth. And remember, in 1974, they tried permanent daylight savings and they abandoned it. So I really don't know where this is going to go. 
what is the role of the neurologist in this debate? What do you think we have to contribute as we see these issues coming up amongst our patients, as we read about them in the news? How should we be thinking about this with the brain front and center? So I do think we need to acknowledge that this is somewhat of a strain on the nervous system, okay, to to make this change. I think we need to perhaps continue to advocate for some morning light. I think we have some evidence for that to be the case, okay? Personally, I don't even think I would push for an abolishment of daylight savings time for the compelling reason that we can say people should get up at four o'clock to catch the sunrise, but people are not going to get up at four o'clock to catch the sunrise. That's just not going to happen. And maybe we can consider our entire society at the same time. So I'm actually personally coming around to saying maybe we should stay the way they are. But we do need to recognize that as neurologists, we do need to counsel people a little bit about what to do. And I definitely want to hear from you on that. At least for the time being, these shifts are going to persist in most states and provinces. What advice do we need to be giving to our patients, and particularly those patients who have underlying sleep disorders, sleep complaints, or other neurological illnesses that might place them at greater risk during these times of transition? Exactly. So I think there's a few things. So first of all, if you're not a person who struggles with sleep problems in general, and you generally have a healthy sleep pattern, don't freak out about this, okay? There is nobody advising people not to drive from Detroit to Chicago in a day because that's an hour time change. Many of us neurologists who are circadian rhythm specialists routinely get on planes and fly to Europe or fly to Asia, and we know it's tough, but we're kind of okay. So I think it's important not to overstress the strain on people who otherwise have good sleep. But if you have troubles with sleep, I think there are a few things that one could do. So the first thing, which is kind of obvious, is try to soften the blow. So if you know that daylight savings is coming, change your bedtime for half an hour for a few days, change it again, and then change it again at the transition, and you might find a little bit easier. Practice healthy sleep habits. So there's general sleep habits uh, that we all should be following. Avoid excessive alcohol. No caffeine late at night. Make sure you get good exercise, but don't exercise late in the evening. If you can't sleep, don't stay in bed. These Typical sleep hygiene techniques can be very important for people who are just generally suffering. And then probably most critical is during the transitions, get daylight, go outside. What is, I think, most important is the in the spring is morning and early afternoon exposure, particularly our young people who are struggling to get their body clocks on that 23-hour day that they had to deal with. And in the fall, in November, I think it's more difficult because there's less sun, but just go outside in the day as much as you can, probably including the afternoon, even into the late afternoon. And there's a general sort of feeling like, Early to bed, early to rise, getting morning light is important. Get your adolescents out of bed or put them in the house with the east windows because getting started early in the day uh, does appear to be associated with health benefits. So get your daylight during the transitions, get good sleep hygiene techniques, and get outside. I love that practical advice. Get outdoors, get that exercise, take the podcast with you if you're a neurological practitioner. And if I suppose if that doesn't work, people could always move to Arizona, Saskatchewan, Yukon, or Hawaii, depending on your personal preferences for temperament and temperatures. I've been speaking with Ron Postuma, lead author on the paper titled Effects of Season and Daylight Savings Time Shifts on Sleep Symptoms, a Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. This is a publication that you can and should read in neurology. Thanks so much, Ron. Pleasure. Thank you. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, where you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.